It's time to get the breakdown started. First up, 10 observations. It's first and 10. Numero uno. Number one. The Commanders needed that. And I know they did not win. I'm aware that the Commanders lost in overtime in somewhat ridiculous fashion in some aspects. And we'll talk about the mistakes and the opportunities and the places to grow and all of that, uh, not only over the next 10 minutes here in First and 10, but over the course of this three-hour-long radio show. But at the end of the day, they needed to show up and they needed to compete. They needed to go toe-to-toe with an elite opponent and they needed to show to not anyone else outside the building, but to themselves that they are actually the team that we thought they could be after two weeks and not the team that lost 37-3 and was completely uncompetitive against the Buffalo Bills. And yes, they played better against Buffalo than that 37-3 final, but they also never were in striking distance. You know, should it have been closer? Yes, but they, they didn't ever feel close in that game. Against the Eagles, like, they got the lead going into halftime. They have a chance to win the football game either by going for two, we'll talk about it, or uh, by performing better in overtime, by having Terry McLaurin have a half-size smaller shoe or the referees potentially on that call having better eyes. Like, there's, there's a lot of ways in which they needed this. And I think that even if, even if they're pissed, which they should be, uh, even if they are disappointed, they should be. And even if you do not get one in the win column, which is you know ultimately the most important thing out of any game, um, from a process standpoint, I think there's a lot to build on, and specifically on the offense, where they just were so in their own way, turnover sacks, uh, specifically in that, that Buffalo game, to come out and have not a perfect performance, but a much cleaner performance where you put up 30 points. And this team has not put up 30 points much at all. I think they only did it once offensively in the Scott Turner era. There was like two or maybe even three games where they topped 30 while Turner was the OC, but all of those games had either pick sixes or fumble returns for touchdowns, except for one. They've scored 30 points offensively twice already this season. That is remarkable. And so there's a lot to build on here. Uh, and that is ultimately a good thing. And it's why when you know Jake Elliott hits that field goal yesterday afternoon, my immediately thought was like, okay. Like, I'm actually more upset today about it than perhaps I was yesterday. Um, But in the moment, in the emotion of the game, I was like, this is fine. Um, And and hopefully I'm not the the dog in the, you know, it's fine. It's on fire. Everything's on fire around you meme. But that was fine. Um, You want to win, but that was fine. Number two. Number two. That said, good for Ron Rivera for being pissed after the game. Uh, Here was Rivera. By the way, uh, in the aftermath, the frustration uh, that he and his team was feeling because they do, despite the good performance in a lot of areas, come up on the wrong end of it. Very much so. I mean, there were some mistakes we made that 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 I, I think you know that that we we we, we got to get past it. That, that, just a little thing, just a couple more little things, a little more details that, that we have to be a little more good with. Because if we are, then, then, I mean, you saw us. We played a very good team out there, and we have a chance. But let's start winning. Good for him. This is the difference in punditry and participation. Um, I've talked about this since literally day one of the show. As pundits, as people who comment on it, whether you're a fan or whether you're it's your job like mine, I have no problem with anyone being like, hey, that's that was good enough. Like, I'm okay when I look at the long-term trajectory of this team looking back on that Eagles game and going, like, they did the things they were largely supposed to do. And by the way, the biggest area of growth, uh, the biggest area, I should say, that cost them the game is the performance of a first-round pick who we'll talk about in Emmanuel Forbes. Like, if you want to pin it on someone, be that guy. Like, yeah, Emmanuel Forbes is the biggest reason they lost yesterday because he gave up explosive plays that led to touchdowns. Uh, and if he doesn't, then they probably win that football game. It doesn't mean there weren't other areas for improvement. That's not me pinning the loss solely on Emmanuel Forbes by any stretch of the imagination. But, like, the most significant contributor? Yeah, it was Forbes. The first-round pick in his fourth career game. And I'm okay with that as a pundit. As a participant, though, I would not be. As a participant, I'd be going, what's the thing I could have done, whether I'm Forbes or anybody else? And if you're Rivera, one, he needs to look in the mirror about a couple of things, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. But I, I think it's important as a tone setter, as a leader, like I think he's doing the exact right thing here 
and going like, nah, this ain't good enough. Like, I'm tired of close. We need to win. We need to... And it's not like we need to figure out a way. It's like, we know the way. We need to do better at doing it. We need to figure out not how to win, but how to execute the details that we've laid out that are a winning game plan. And like that frustration is a good thing to me from Rivera and from the players afterwards in what was a pretty somber locker room in Philadelphia. All right, number three is about going for two. Number three. Go for two. Um, I The more I think about this, the more I am back to my original position, which is that it was a huge mistake not going for two. I do not think it's an indefensible position to kick the the PAT there. When you look out on the field, you see your guys gassed. They've just had this massive thing. And there's a chance that, and I don't know if Rivera would ever fully answer this, but I I think that they might have used their best two-point play earlier in the game. Like, you get to the two-yard line, it's like, what do you like here? You like the Curtis Samuel thing. Okay, we do that. We run it for a touchdown earlier in the game. All of a sudden, you're in a two-point situation later, and you're like, ah, that was the thing that we really liked. And you don't go into a lot of ga- into games with a lot of those plays because you typically don't need them. And it's really hard. I know this sounds crazy, but like it's actually harder in a lot of ways to score from the two than it is from some areas farther back because the space is so compressed. You're lim- like you can't take the top off a of defense to open up underneath stuff. There is no top, and so you wind up with trying to run some stuff on the end line to space it out a little bit. You try to sneak in something quickly underneath. Like, you, do you run it against that D line with those guys inside and your O line being what it is? Like, it's a tough decision. But at the end of the day, it's the right one. It's the right decision. And I know Ron cited fatigue after, and I get it. But if your guys are tired, what do you think their guys are? And you're you. You just spent all this time in the spring and the summer conditioning yourself to be the better team late in games. Alas, you get to that moment and you don't go for it. And at the end of the day, this is, I mean, I'll give you options. Like I can give you play calls. I can give you all kinds of stuff that I would do here. Brian Robinson, six feet tall. Six feet is two yards. Like, can I get him to the line of scrimmage and let him dive and extend the football over the top? Shoot. I know some of y'all hate fades. I live with the fade to Terry McLaurin there. I trust Terry with the game on the line and the ball in the air and what is a theoretically a 50-50 ball if I think that's a ball that Sam can throw well. Like, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with trying something a little more trickery. Um, the Chiefs have been great at that stuff for years, and enemy has got a deep uh, knowledge of, of those types of plays. At the end of the day, it's not an indefensible decision. I do think it is the wrong one to not go for two there. And I do think it becomes less defensible with the point that I will give credit to Grant Paulson for making on his show earlier today, and that is that you play on Thursday. Exposing your guys to an extra 15, 20, 30 snaps of football when you got to turn around and play on Thursday and there's a ton of scientific data that says overtime games tend to linger. I hate that. That is something that like going into the game, you got to think about. And in the moment, if you can think about it then, like great. It just slides what is already an incorrect decision farther in the incorrect lane. And so, yeah, man, like you got to go for two there. Let's talk about Emmanuel Forbes. Number four. <sighs> the one to Brown at the end, I'm not, I'm, I cannot blame Emmanuel Forbes for. The Eagles did something incredibly stupid and got away with it. Barely. Because if Ron goes for two and they get it, imagine what sports talk radio would be like in Philadelphia today. It would be chaos. And it should be. That was such bad game management. And look, If you score a touchdown, like, okay, that means the other team's got to score a touchdown. It's different than scoring a field goal too soon. But at the end of the day, like, you had the commanders in a situation where you did not have to give them the ball back. And instead, and, and like, let's then put that on Emmanuel Forbes. If you're the defense, you're in a situation where you have to get the ball back. You have to generate a turnover. And if they're going to be dumb enough to throw, I'm going to go get a pick. And because... Like, do the Eagles use that mentality against Forbes and the Commanders? Absolutely. And do they score a touchdown out of it? Yeah. But, like, that's kind of the best thing that could happen for the Commanders is it happens quickly, and now you got a chance, and they go down, and ultimately Howell makes the throw to to Dotson, and they score. But I can't hold that one against Forbes for going and trying to make a play in a situation where you need to make a play, and it's preposterous that they would use that aggression against you. That said, uh, there is a 
reality about some plays earlier in the game that it's not good enough for Emmanuel Forbes. Um, jumping the, the, the bubble screen. But also, you wonder who else jumped it? Derek Forrest. And I put that, you know, if Forrest doesn't jump it, then he's in position to make a tackle and help Forbes out. And so when Forbes makes a, his, his gamble, he's thinking he's going to not give up a touchdown. Like, yeah, he gives up a big play, and that's not good. Explosive plays kill you. But it, that play should not have been a touchdown, and that's on a lot of other people on that defense. And so it's a bad day for Emmanuel Forbes, any way you want to slice it. Um, he's a first-round pick. It's his fourth career game, and he got got by one of the seven or eight best receivers in football. That stuff happens. But he never stopped competing, and I think he'll learn from this, and that's great. But if you want to make a final point here, this one is the hardest one to swallow. You can't have a coach saying this on Wednesday about you. Um, I think when you, you know, in watching him and some of the things that he does, I think he's got to continue to work on his technique and, 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 and really be even better with it. I mean, he's got a tremendous skill set. He's got great quicks. He's got a great plant and drive. Um, but I, I sometimes you just, his, you know, his, his footwork, his, his, his body positions, he can be better at it. He really can. I mean, he's, he's such a young player. Um, and I just think it's about him refining the technique that he's going to use and he's going to play with. And then saying this about you on Sunday, I think it was. They, I think they. I think what they did was they, they took a, an experienced guy and, and and did some things. You know, they, they ran that bubble and go, and 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 you know he was he 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 guessed. And you've got to be disciplined. You've got to read your keys and and make your plays. It's that simple. If your coach is talking on Wednesday about your technique and you don't play the technique and then you get burned, there's only so much we can defend you. Got to be better from Emmanuel Forbes. Um, but I do like competitiveness, and the last one like is what it is. All right, uh, let's roll a little bit faster here. Number five. The defense actually played okay outside of Forbes, and I know no one wants to hear that. They've given up 30 in three of four games this season. Overall, that's not good enough. Even if you take the pick six away last week against Buffalo, they still scored 30. Um, bad spots, like offense didn't help them, other situations that you can you can parse it every once, you know, every which way. But Last, you know, yesterday, like, they got killed by explosive plays. And if they don't give up those two plays, like, you know, and then obviously they score in overtime. So it's 31 minus 14. They give up 17 points and you're talking about a different ball game. Like, that's a really great defensive performance where you're talking about how they were disciplined and how they were solid. And they they held DeAndre Swift, although there was the, the stretch where he got going a little bit. But they held Swift, you know, to... Under four and a half yards of carry. It's one of Swift's worst games of the year outside of that, obviously, week one where he barely got any touches. Um, you know, they they held Jalen uh, largely in check uh, outside of a couple of big plays, and those plays are on to Emmanuel Forbes. Like, three massive explosive plays where Devontae Smith gets him on a big one, uh, and then the two big ones to Brown. Unfortunately, that's not how the game works. The game doesn't work. X, you know, oh, you're good 75%, 80, even 90% of snaps if the other 10% are big, giant, explosive plays. But I will I will say that, just to say this, when the defense grades out later in the week, like when PFF puts out their grades and when Logan and I talk about this on Take Command on our tape review podcast, there's going to be a lot of defenders with very good grades in this game. Unfortunately, that is not enough for where this team is and how they're built, where you need them to be great. And the one issue that I have with this defense right now, the pass rush even, I'm willing to give it and, and see what we got against a non-mobile quarterback. We're not going to find out on Thursday um, where I think they need to rush similarly against Justin Fields, make him beat you from the pocket, don't take chances. And they did a much better job of that. But they've got to find ways to create turnovers. Like you can't be great defensively without creating turnovers. And they have not figured out how to create turnovers so far this year. The right mix of coverages, pressures, and ultimately execution. Because they've had a couple go through their hands. Number six. Other thing is situational football. And I know a lot of people have talked about this. So I'm just going to say the thing and then I'm not going to hammer it. End of the game. Um, the setup of the game winning field goal. Why are you playing so far off? Like, you have to treat the first down line like the field goal line. You And also, you're sending pressure. The ball's coming out quick. Why are you not marrying your coverage and your pressure? Why are you not all over the receivers? Yeah, you don't want to commit a penalty. Okay. Uh, but if you can force an incompletion there, you're going to get a punt and you get another chance. And instead, they give up a couple yards. That's enough uh, yardage-wise to... Uh, get Jake Elliott in field goal range. He kicks a field goal. Game's over. Situational football. 
Um, you know, we, we talked about Forbes. He had a couple uh, situational things. And then it's making plays in big spots, too. Like, there, there's the first down that they pick up on the, the quick swing pass when Jamin Davis uh, is right there. James Smith-Williams says Jalen Hurts go through his hands on a big spot, and he gets a big scramble. Like, you got to finish plays, and that's where this defense has a chance to elevate. They're playing solid down in, down out, but they got to make plays, and that's something they just haven't done well enough yet this season. Number seven. Let's talk about Tressway. Oh, this one hurts. This one hurts me so bad. Um... At the end of the day, like Tressway has been the best guy at his job of anyone on the team for a long time. And he had a really bad day yesterday. Specifically, he just screws the pooch on a 30 yard punt in overtime. And like, it's bizarre. You're not used to it. It's Superman, you know, not, not saving the day. Um, if he booms that inside the 10, different ball game. You got to drive it. Like, this defense probably has a better chance of holding up. And instead, you get you get Tress with a bad one. And he knew it. His body language said it all. I don't even know. There's not a lot of analysis here. Um, it just, let, you know, pointing out different things that happened in the game and could affect it. And when you talk about playing a full team game, like special teams has not been good for this team this year. Which, by the way, let's actually add this. I had, I had room for one, and now I've got it. Uh, so, uh, Anthony, if you would, please. Number eight. Number eight. Um, the Jamison Crowder fair catch thing. That was weird. Like, Jamison definitely waved for a fair catch or shaded the sun uh, from his eyes in uh, the the exact hand signal of a fair catch and then took off. And I don't know whether he was trying to fake something. It seemed like he didn't even, like, wasn't aware that he did it. But that's the correct call there. Um, and I'm glad it's not a penalty anymore. Just like, no, you fair caught it. You're there. Do whatever you want after. But the ball stops there. But that was absolutely the correct call in that situation. And it was, I thought it was very, like, I'd be curious to ask Jamison, like, hey, buddy, once you watch the tape, did you realize why they said you called a fair catch? And he'd be like, yeah, because I called a fair catch. That was weird. Okay, back to more serious things. Number nine. Sam was way better in this game. He still took too many sacks, but on basically every other play outside of, like, the missed shot to Terry and one or two other throws, he was really good. He was way more decisive. Um, he got the ball out. Uh, I think a lot of the sacks are probably going to wind up being on the O-line uh, this week as opposed to you, you're pretty sure they're on him in some of these earlier games. Uh, but deliver the ball accurately. Um, the the playmaking with his feet is exceptional. And then I think he was set up for success, which brings us to last but not least. Number 10. Eric Bieniemy was on it yesterday. And I love the way he moved the pocket. I love the way that he mixed in the run a lot more early. Um, I think he found ways to generate touches in space for Terry McLaurin specifically, but also Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel. Like he did a really good job of generating touches for the right playmakers at the right time, getting them in space, keeping the Eagles off balance. And that set Sam up for success as the day went. If that's what this offense looks like, they're going to be just fine this year. The defense has traditionally started slow and then figured it out. You're four games in, they got to figure it out. But I feel way better about this offense and specifically with EB's hold of his own personnel after this game compared to the nightmare against Buffalo. All right, that is first and 10. First segment of the day, 10 observations from every single Commander's game. And when we get back here on the Hoffman Show, you'll hear more analysis from Logan Paulson. Take command on a Monday here on the Hoffman Show. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.